Okay, welcome everybody. Um, we have a lot to cover today as usual, and um, I want to make sure we get as much time to do that as possible. You'll forgive my uh, raspy voice. I'm getting over cold like the rest of the world. So um, I also uh, want to say that uh, we have a, um, some very interesting conversations today. Um, and uh, the, the, the main thing that, that I think is going to be interesting for us is we're switching now to think as much about individual choice uh, as group uh, policy and behavior. And um, th this is going to be really m much of the focus of the rest of the semester. Uh, before I get into any more framing remarks, um, uh, I wanted to ask you about two things. Um, the first is um, I just left Emory University and surprise, surprise, there's a university course um, going in its second year at Emory University because we tried it as a pilot last spring about a year ago. There was some interest on the part of Emory students to meet the university course people at the Duke student, of the Duke students, you guys. So um, would people be interested in trying to set up a E, uh, a link where you could at least say hello for five or ten minutes and talk a little bit about your experience. That's what they wanted to do. Nodding, yes, sure, sounds interesting. Okay, their topic, by the way, is AIDS. Um, so it's a real different, but it's the same kind of idea. Um, the topic previous to that, that I started last year, was um, the use of meth uh, and, and uh, methamphetamine, particularly focusing on Nick Redding's book on the use of meth in a small Iowa town. And it's always really interesting. It's a very different format, but I think it'd be really fun to link the two groups in conversation. So, okay, I'll, I'll get back to them about that. Um, so we're delighted to welcome here today uh, Gavin Fitzsimmons. Um, and if those of you done the reading, I know that you'll have a lot of interesting anecdotes to bring to this larger question of consumer choice and aversion and, and so on. He's the R. David Thomas Professor of Marketing and Psychology at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business, of which several of you come from. Um, his research focuses on understanding the ways in which consumers may be influenced without their conscious knowledge or awareness by marketers and marketing researchers often without any intent on the part of the marketer, which is the interesting, there are many interesting parts of his research, but this is one of them. His work has been published in numerous academic journals, such as the Journal of Consumer Research, Journal of Marketing Research, Marketing Science, Management Science, Organizational Behavior and Human Decision Processes, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, and Psychological Science. And he's also a public intellectual, which is a key value for me as Dean of Arts and Sciences. I want to make sure that we do a lot of public scholarship in the university, as we have been doing in this class, in relationship to Will Allen and other speakers. Um, and Professor Fitzsimmons' ideas have been featured in many popular press outlets, such as NPR, CNN, MSNBC, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Psychology Today, Oprah Magazine, Time Magazine, amongst many others. And I think he's an extraordinary model for all of us in this engagement. Um, and he also serves as an associate editor of the Journal of Consumer Research. So please welcome Gavin Fitzsimmons from the Business School. <laughs> and our respondent uh, today, uh, our point, counterpoint, however we think about this, is Harris Solomon, who has just arrived at Duke as Assistant Professor of Cultural Anthropology and Global Health. Um, and his interest is in <coughs> consumerism and chronic, cho chronic illness. I was about to say chronic choice. That's a really interesting slip. Uh, <laughs> chronic illness in urban India. Um, and as India increasingly becomes portrayed as the site of an epi epidemiological transition, he writes, a shift from infectious to chronic disease burdens are said to accompany economic development become um, very interesting questions for anyone to look at. Um, and he talks about this as the embodied politics of accumulation, which I think is a wonderful phrase. And he's currently working on a book project that examines the relationships forged between food, fat, and the body in the light of India's rising rates of obesity and diabetes. This is something that came up last week in a very interesting, different way. And it draws on ethnographic field work carried out in Mumbai's home kitchens, metabolic disorder clinics, and food companies. And he really wants to better understand what have been called India's diseases of prosperity. Um, and Harris's research, like Gavin Fitzsimmons, is very much interdisciplinary. Um, and he really sees himself at the um, intersection of medical anthropology, South Asian studies, science and technology studies, global health, and food studies. So please welcome um, 
uh, Professor Harris Solomon to Duke and to this class. <laughs> so, um, two weeks ago, we got a glimpse into the possibilities of reform in urban food practices with Will Allen. Last week, we got practically the opposite point of view um, from an intense financial glimpse from Britt Barter into the real economics of real companies trading in agribusiness and thinking about feeding or not feeding the world. We got a sense of the cost of agribusiness from any number of places in this course, but we only last week got a view of the actual consolidation of corporations the Death Stars that Britt Barter was talking about, their relationship to sovereign funds, which is one of the most important, I learned from last week, the most important financial transactions that are going on globally today. When you have a government that can inject its sovereign funds into a food company, you have an entirely different situation on your hands. And don't forget that's happened only in the last three years. Um, and we thought about these corporations' um, capacity and these consolidated groups, to co to their capacity to overtake competitive markets. Very, very interesting kinds of questions about real world, real food, real globalism. Now, while we did not expect you to know all the ins and outs of the global financing of agribusiness, and it was um, a bit of a deep dive, um, we do think that your, um, an, our collective understanding of corn, fuel, and meat product markets um, and how they can account for a huge percentage of financial transactions in the world today is essential to understanding food and food studies. And the other thing that was so important to me about uh, what Britt Barter said is that the market is also hugely affected by changing diet, which is one of the focuses of Harris Solomon's research and indirectly um, in Gavin Fitzsimmons' research. And we're here, we'll be hearing both about that today in a number of different ways. Um, as a kind of way into, as you know, we have a lot of email traffic about this course amongst the TAs, which are they're extraordinary folks, and we, as we were anticipating um, our class today, um, we had an interesting um, food moment that um, one of our wonderful TAs, Tiff Shao, um, shared with us, and it's about the frozen shark. P fermented, excuse me, I, a fermented shark. So I've asked her to just share a little bit about what happened with her and Icelandic fermented shark. If you want to just get up. So the short story is a couple of my friends went to Iceland for spring break without me. And um, <laughs> Iceland has really a really unique food culture, but one of their delicacies is something called, and I'm going to pronounce it wrong, it's like hakarl or hakarl or something. It's spelled H-A-K-A-R-L. And um, they saw this rotting shark meat and they immediately thought of me. I was <laughs> extremely honored. But basically they brought me back some and they asked me to taste it. They all stood like six feet away from me in the room and watched as I tasted it. And what Harkarl is, it's fermented Greenland shark. The shark grows over a ton, ton and how they make this shark is they gut it and they put the shark in the sand. And after a while they take it out and hang it for six months and then you have the shark meat. Um, it's also the taste, I, I didn't know what this was beforehand but I did some research afterwards and people described the taste of it akin to the taste of shattered dreams. So I don't know what that means. But um, it's often listed as one of the most disgusting foods in the world. And if I had to describe it, I would say, imagine chewing a piece of whale blubber while taking a shot of ammonia as, at the same time. And that's kind of what it tasted like. But it was pretty good. I really liked it, besides the ammonia burn. But um, so basically, you must wonder, why would anybody eat stuff like this? Well, it goes. If you think the Greenland shark itself is full of urea and other chemicals in its body, and those are actually toxic. So if you eat, if you cook Greenland shark as it is and you treat it like any other meat, it would probably kill you. So what they do is they bury it in the sand and they put rocks on top of it so that as the body decays, the toxins are pushed out of the body, and it's a way of turning this inedible animal into an en into an edible animal. But it says a lot about different cultures and the cuisines and how people have adapted to what's given around them. So I just found it really interesting. And I encourage you all to try it if you ever get the chance. <laughs> um, the reason why I asked Tiff to, to share that is because it sparked a really interesting conversation amongst us about why people eat what they do. 
Um, and I, I think that, um, as she mentioned in our email conversation, um, pretty much 100% of the world is edible if you treat it right. And that was one of the things that we were talking about. Is that true? How do we think about it if it is? Um, and so it raises the question of um, ideological choices, cultural choices, personal choices, social choices around the consumption of food. Um, and I think that is a, a really interesting lens that we haven't um, really uh, emphasized as much. We've looked at group behavior and company behavior, and now we're thinking about the relationship between individual and social behavior together and that interaction. Um, and we're looking particularly in the next few weeks at food and consumer choice and the ways in which different consumer choice has effects across the globe. And so we're, in a sense, as we move into this phase, bracketing the b debate between the local and the industrial, even though that has been a focus for us for the first part of the course, and thinking about um, the role of disgust as well as passion in food choices. Um, and uh, if you think about everything in the world being edible, um, that everything living can also be understood as food, medicine, or poison. And the differences between these functions has to do with quantity and preparation. This is something that Kathy Rudy contributed to our conversation later. Um, and if this is true, why do we eat only some things and not others? Um, and why do some things, like rotting shark, um, disgust us and then not disgust us, depending on, on where we are? Um, and I think uh, this will be very important for any number of reasons because it does um, link individual psychology, but link it to the larger food patterns and social forms that we have been talking about up to this point. Um, and uh, part of the reason why we're now talking more about linking is that, as I mentioned last week, we're now um, <clears throat> wanting to turn at least part of our attention in the remainder of the semester to the what Kathy Rudy has called the more than interdisciplinary discussions that we've been having all semester. And as she puts it, and I was just so thrilled because it's exactly the kind of way that I want to move the university more broadly, more than interdisciplinary means for her, it's one thing for history and English literature scholars, for example, to talk to each other. They use different methods in different disciplines, but more or less have the same goal of knowledge production as their desired outcome. But what we're doing in this class, speaking across schools, is much harder because scholars from different professional schools and from undergrad have very different what she calls end games that are not adequately captured by the idea of simple knowledge production. They're in the business of the end game of healing bodies or saving souls or adjudicating law or overseeing international relations or cleaning up the environment. Many, many different end games. Um, and knowledge production might be a part of that, but the practical application of what you do with your life with these skills is paramount for many, many people in this class. So as we build towards the end of the semester, we're going to be trying to notice how these different agendas that we all bring um, and formations that we all bring interact and inform and maybe even transform each other. And I think that's a crucial piece. So I want to pause here to remind everybody that um, <coughs> where you are going to be handing in your papers and then we'll be getting <coughs> back to you with a <coughs> final paper idea. And what we're going to be doing are two things. One is I'll be circulating to the TAs very explicit study questions for us to think about as we continue our conversations in small groups about this more than interdisciplinary, what I call kind of transformational mutuality of intellectual perspectives. Um, and asking the TAs to think about and um, think with their groups about these differing agendas. And in addition, um, part of the way we're developing our final paper topic will be to ask you to bring two perspectives on food together and reflect upon their complementarity. Not just, yay, we need both things, but how do they actually transform each other? The best kind of interdisciplinarity and the best kind of university is when two disciplines actually help and transform each other. Not just coexist by, side by side, but push each other to be better. 
Um, Gavin Fitzsimmons um, today is going to be taking a markets approach just to take the example of more than interdisciplinarity down to the specific thing we're going to be doing today. He has wanted to know in his research what discusses us, how we can use those reactions to build stronger market, markets, um, how can grocery stores make those mechanisms work for them rather than against them. But the anthropologist, on the other hand, is going to want to dig out how disgust is used to construct culture and identity. So as Kathy was thinking about the mutual complementarity that we're going to be hearing from today, um, much like the Icelanders are using the rotting shark as a marker of their identity, and I wonder if you were just given this and it wasn't a gift whether you would have eaten it. That's another, that's an anthropology, an, an ethnographic question. Um, the, uh, uh, anthropologist is going to show us how certain foods, uh, foodies, in particular local cheese producers, use disgusting things to make our food and how much we love it in this context. So uh, we think, Charlie, Kathy, and I together think that our goal might be to today, beginning today, how to watch how these two presenters tell their stories, how each of the stories might shift just a little bit in light of the other stories. Um, what is Gavin Fitzsimmons seeing that Harris Solomon is missing and vice versa? Um, so let's not just try to compare and to contrast, but see both in the same frame and how they may mutually define each other. Um, and so I'll end with that challenge and turn it over to the much anticipated Mr. Fitzsimmons. Welcome. Um, thanks very much for, uh, for having me over. Uh, one of the reasons I came to Duke uh, 10 years ago was the promise of interdisciplinarity. And I've been at many institutions over the years where you would never find a course like this happening. And so this is fabulous. I love it. So um, I'm going to talk today. So my background, I'm a consumer psychologist. I study the hows and whys consumers do what they do. <coughs> Eating is obviously a huge piece of consumption and um, of the consumption space. And so what I'm going to do today, um, you guys read the piece on disgust in consumption settings. I'm going to actually I take, I'm going to take a little bit of a step back and give a little bit of a broader perspective. One of the things I'll talk about is discuss, but I'm going to talk about some other stuff too. OK, so when you make your food choices, you're making careful, considered choices that are good for your bodies and good for the world around us, right? <laughs> yeah? yeah? All right. That's our intention. And I think that m m I, I suspect that every person in the room is, has that as an intention, OK? Um, I'm going to review work in our lab that basically is going to cast doubt on this assumption. And we're going to, I'm going to talk about things that are occurring outside of our conscious awareness. And I'm going to talk about the influence of social others in our environment on the food choices that we make, OK? Um, so before I, I leap right in here, um, so uh, just a show of hands, how many of you have been exposed to sort of experimental methods, sort of basic psychology type approaches to things? Just a, so a decent number not. OK, so I'm an experimentalist. I run experiments, I control a whole bunch of things, and vary something, OK? And the something that I vary is the thing I'm really interested in, and I'm able to make comparisons from one group to another, OK? That's one approach. And, and that's just sort of a philosophy of science approach. That was the one that I grew up in that I was interested in. We'll hear others uh, pretty shortly, in fact. Um, so you're going to see a bunch of comparisons between groups. And through those comparisons, I'm going to try to draw some inferences about the, people, the psychology of people's eating behavior. OK, so let me start with the first one. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is uh, this notion of healthy options. So I think, yeah, so uh, a good number, a number of years ago, I sat down with a, one of my, my research teams, and we were talking about the fact that, as you guys uh, presumably have run across at some point, the global diet is basically in the garbage, OK? <laughs> people are getting bigger and bigger. Um, uh, around the world, all right? It's particularly true here in the US. Um, the prescriptive solution uh, from a public policy perspective in many situations, think about school districts, for example, um, was we need to have some healthy choices, all right? We can't just have this crappy stuff. Um, we have to have healthy choices. And so that was the solution that was proposed. And so if you compared 15 years ago to today, Almost every dining environment you go to has a healthy choice, right? <laughs> McDonald's, they've got a salad, OK? The, um, you go to a, a K through 12 uh, dining environment, they've got chicken nuggets, pizza, bacon cheeseburger, and steamed broccoli, all right? 
You, you go to a vending machine, which used to be filled with candy bars. Now there's a bunch of candy bars and a granola bar. All right? OK? So the percentage of places that have a healthy option has gone way up, but so too has our size. All right? How do we reconcile these two pieces of data? And um, so we sort of took it into the lab. We had some ideas about what might be uh, driving it. And here's what we do. So here's the setup. People come in, and they're getting an option for uh, a side with their lunch. All right? So, so they're, they're choosing a sandwich. And then they're either going to get fries, a baked potato with butter and sour cream, or chicken nuggets. All right. I noticed chicken nuggets was on the menu tonight, by the way. All right. Uh, so um, uh, all three of these things are really bad for you. Um, perhaps not our chicken nuggets tonight, but uh, normally chicken nuggets are bad for you. Um, and um, we're interested in what happens out of that set of choices. Which one do you choose? So you imagine in your head which th of these three things you would choose, OK? Another group of people comes in, sees the exact same menu, but instead of just the three unhealthy things, we add a side salad to the menu. All right? So imagine you're in that bottom situation. How many of you guys, show of hands, would choose a side salad? OK, so uh, for those of you in the front about, I would say, two-thirds of the folks in the room put up their hand with the side salad. That's consistent with data we've collected with kids from um, 15 to 18, college age, um, young professionals up to retirees, okay? That percentage, somewhere in the 50 to 70% range, okay? The actual data when we run the studies, somewhere in the less than 5% range. Actually choose the side salad, okay? We all intend to choose the side salad, but we don't actually choose the side salad, okay? So what I'm gonna do and what you see here is I'm gonna just set aside the 5% of people that actually choose the side salad and say, good for you, I'm very happy for you, all right? And what I'm interested in is what does the side salad, the presence of the side salad, do to our choice among the unhealthy things? Which of these is the least healthy for you? Anytime french fries are in a set and somebody asks you which is the um, least healthy for you, it's always french fries. Okay, think about it. What is it? It's a sliver of food product that's deep fried. All right? There's nothing nutritious in there at all. You're basically just eating congealed fat. Think about that next time you, uh, you <laughs> grab one of those fries, okay? All right. So fries are horrible for you, all right? And so what I'm interested in is, does the presence of the salad actually shift people from eating, say, a moderately bad for you thing to something really bad for you? And so when you just see the three bad for you options, 10% of people choose the french fries. When I add a side salad to the menu, it triples. The presence of the healthy option makes you much more likely to choose the really bad for you thing. Okay? Lest you worry that this is, yeah. Just to clarify, so this is what they're actually ordering and not when they say this is what they're going to This is what they order. Yeah, we have a man in front of a cafeteria state. We did it with hypotheticals, but this, is, this one is, in fact, in front of the actual cafeteria station where they place the order. Yes, they may only choose one side uh, with, their, um, with, their, uh, with their lunch. Yeah. Um, and sometimes people are like, well, there's something weird about this set of options that leads to this. So we replicate it with a bacon double cheeseburger, a fried chicken sandwich, a fried fish sandwich. When we add uh, either a veggie or a grilled chicken sandwich, everybody wants the bacon double cheeseburger. When we do Oreos dipped in chocolate, because Oreos aren't enough, <laughs> Oreos, golden Oreos, when we add the 100 calorie pack, everybody wants the Oreos dipped in chocolate, OK? So this, just adding one uh, sort of healthy option leads you to, all of a sudden, not only do most people not choose the healthy option, but its presence leads you to go crazy and get the really bad for you thing, all right? So um, this, of course, explains a lot. So those of you that have any familiarity with some of the fast food companies, um, they don't talk about this. But the presence of those side salads on the menus have been huge profit increases, have led to huge profit increases for fast food operations, not because they sell any of them, okay? But because they draw people into the store, and once you're in the store, what do you do? You're like, ah, you have a Big Mac, fries, and a pie, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, there's some data. Yeah, there's some data out there on that. That 
um, that ordering you know, the, the diet soda can actually liberate you to balance out and go crazy. All right? So we're separating that aside. I mean, I mean, I think that's a very real effect. Um, in particular, if you're not a regular diet soda drinker, right? Like, I drink about 12 of these a day. I, I know that's not good for me. Um, but, uh, you know, so that doesn't affect me. But for someone that is a, a regular Coke drinker, when they order that diet, it does actually liberate them to balance out and have the unhealthy thing across the rest of the menu. Um, I'm just going to jump in here. I can tell just from my own level and my guess is this is such interesting stuff that Professor Fitzsimmons may not get through. If you wouldn't mind writing down your questions, I know he can go back to the earlier part of the lecture and hold them until the very end. Okay, all right. Uh, if, there's some, if there's a clarification, feel free to do a quick clarification. But if there, if there are bigger ones, well, maybe we can hold them. Okay. So um, when we saw this data, we replicated it a couple of times in different environments, including vending machines and whatnot. Um, and we were really interested about what, why is this happening? How can this actually be the case? And so. Here's the basic logic. And I've got these explanations up here as if they're sort of conscious, deliberative things. They're not. These are occurring outside people's conscious awareness. So you see that side salad up on the menu, and you think to yourself, well, I had a salad yesterday. Bring on the fries. Or you see the salad on the menu, and you think, I'm going to have a salad tomorrow. Bring on the fries. Either way, you're bringing on the fries, OK? And, and the notion is that, that um, the, the title of the, this work, we call it vicarious goal fulfillment. You have a goal to eat healthy, and the presence of the salad up on the menu actually vicariously fulfills the goal to eat healthy, even though you don't choose it. It's alone up there, so it's very salient. You notice it, and, and it then satisfies the goal to be healthy. All right. Now, if that is true, I'm going to show you some data to support this conjecture. Um, if that was true, it should be the case that people that have strong goals to eat healthy, ironically enough, are the ones that are most vulnerable to this effect, right? Because if they have a goal to eat healthy, there's something to be satisfied by seeing that salad. If I don't have a goal to eat healthy, nothing happens when I see the salad. And so this is, this uh, red line is when they just see the unhealthy things up there, okay? And the idea is that this is the percentage of time you choose the thing that's the worst for you. So the fries, if you like, or the, the chocolate dipped Oreo. Um, when you're low in self-control, in other words, when you don't have a goal to be healthy, you choose a lot of the thing that's worse for you. As you are higher in self-control, in other words, as you are more likely to have a regular goal to eat healthy, you become a lot less likely to choose the thing that's worst for you. Unless we add a healthy option to the menu. In which case, when you're over here with this goal, all of those hands that went up about I'd have the salad, you're over here with the goal to eat healthy, the presence of the salad satisfies that goal to eat healthy, and you go crazy and you order the, the french fries, OK? All right. Um, OK, so that's sort of one uh, piece of data that, um, that uh, is talking about these non-conscious influences, OK? So um, you guys read the article. I couldn't help but put this in. Uh, we did this uh, at one point for one of the uh, magazines that was featuring this stuff. Um, so um, this notion of, of contagion is one that is a very powerful one, and one that when I confront people with it, they deny. Okay, so I'll tell you in a little bit about some of the some of this stuff. But okay, so discussed. Everybody knows basically. We all it's sort of a universal uh, sort of experience or, or uh, uh, emotion. Um, most of us think of disgust as being very consciously experienced, but its influence, as I'm going to show you in a second, as you guys read about, might not be so conscious. Okay, so. We went and we looked in, we asked consumers about things in the supermarket that might have made them feel disgusted, OK? And there's some pretty crazy stuff. So top 10 selling items in a supermarket that aren't food, all right? Six of them score above a midpoint on a scale, like a 1 to 10 from not at all disgusting to enormously disgusting. Six of them are above the midpoint on disgust. Trash bags, diapers, gastrointestinal products, dog food, cat litter, cat food, OK? And then in addition, there's a bunch of food type products that people find really disgusting. Or these are not all food products. But, uh, but you got you know oils of various types, lards, things like that. Um, feminine hygiene products score real high. Cigarettes, incontinence things, um, uh, you know, mayonnaise. Anybody think mayonnaise is disgusting? Wow, look how many hands went up. OK. So some of the people in the room love mayonnaise. 
and some people can't stand mayonnaise. My, my wife makes a gag reflex at the sound of mayonnaise. You just say, <laughs> mayonnaise, she goes, Ooh. It, was, it was so horrible for her, okay? So there are these products in the supermarket that elicit feelings of disgust, and we're putting them in our baskets, all right? So what is that doing to us? Okay, so here's the basic first study that we, or one of the first studies that we ran along this. We had people come in. We had an item that we knew we had pre-tested to find that people found it to be somewhat disgusting. And we either had it come in direct physical contact with or be very close to a consumable good. And then we went back an hour later and asked them what they thought about the product. Okay, so here's the setup. It was in a, in a, a shopping basket. And we had the shopping basket sit at the front of a room like this. And we asked everybody to come up, have a look at the products in the... Uh, in the basket, then go back and fill in a little booklet, okay? And basically they come up and what they see is in the basket, there's Cheerios, there's some maxi pads, there's some chocolate chip cookies, and there's a box of Kleenex. And they're either an inch apart or the boxes are touching. Now I should add that feminine hygiene products are by definition sterile, okay? It's not possible to pick up any bacterial thing or anything like that, okay? These things are about as clean as you can get in the supermarket, okay? <laughs> All right? So anything here that's going on in terms of contamination is by definition sort of irrational. And when, and you'll see, in a, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll go to that in a second. Okay, so touching, non-touching. The reason that we went with touching, non-touching is that we have developed this notion, this naive sort of, it's kind of a magical thinking kind of notion. I don't know if you're going to talk a little bit about some of this stuff. So uh, magical thinking kind of notion that, that products or feelings or emotions or things can actually, traits can transfer from person to person. So the, remember we played the cooties? You know, you've got the cooties now, right? When we were kids, the cooties, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, you can't just wipe them off. You, you're stuck with them. So, no, no, that's right. no, I got the cooties from the shark eater here. Okay. So, um, so... We have these naive theories about how things are transferred, and there's been a lot of dialogue about evolutionary, why that has come to pass and whatnot. You can think about many, many years ago, before we had notions of airborne germs, I just noted that when I touched someone that was sick, I died, okay? Or the other people noticed that, okay? And if I didn't touch them, I didn't die, and so they thought maybe that thing, we, we evolved to think that perhaps um, it was touch doing this. So, it turns out that that residual is still very active today, as you guys have seen. So, so we found that if they were actually touching, the evaluations of the cookies were dramatically lower than if those boxes were not in touch with one another, okay? And again, one sterile, they're both in boxes. It's the boxes touching. It's not even the products coming into contact with one another. Just for, I, we don't, I don't think we reported it in the paper, but at the end of the study, we, uh, or some of the sessions, we would take the cookies that had been in contact with the, with the uh, feminine hygiene products, take the box of cookies, and stand at the front as people were leaving, and say, oh, thanks so much for participating. Do you want a cookie? It was awesome. <laughs> Nobody would touch these things. It's like, oh, I'm on the diet, on my way to the gym. People would come up with every imaginable explanation, okay? If they were an inch apart, stand at the front thing, would you like a cookie? Oh, thanks, can I have one for my roommate? They'd be gone instantaneously, all right? So people had this aversion to it and would generate these sort of explanations for why it was that they didn't actually want the cookies, okay? Um, uh, just as people often ask the question, so I put this slide in. It is more pronounced for men um, because men tend to have m higher disgust uh, evaluations of feminine hygiene products, the product is uh, the result is still there for women who also have this sort of uh, mi it's a milder disgust reaction to the product category. Um, just a quick illustration here: uh, one of the things we thought was interesting is it, is it really like a cooties type thing that something can actually transfer the properties from one good to another? So we ran this one. Um, where we were looking at, again, contact versus not contact, but this time, I, sorry, this is actually not the actual product. It wasn't Crisco, um, this is vegetable, it was a lard product. Um, and so the lard was either touching the rice cakes or not touching the rice cakes, and what we found was when it was touching, um, people were actually believed that there was much more fat in the rice cakes. Anybody that's ever eaten a rice cake knows there's no fat in the rice cakes, okay? But they believed that there was much more fat in those rice cakes than if the product, uh, box, again, the packages of the products had not been touching, okay? And this is magnified for those that 
are sort of, again, more disgusted by fat. Uh, again, the proxy to gender here was whether you were fat phobic or not. Okay, so uh, just a quick one. This is in some new work we've been doing. Um, we looked at, uh, we partnered with a, a large uh, 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 pharmacy and had data on 800,000 of their customers over a two-year period, um, looked at shopping baskets, including disgusting items. And so here was, here's, for example, the percentage of, of shopping baskets. So by shopping basket, I mean like all the items that you've purchased that day, okay? So of the shopping basket, of the average person, 38% of them included food products, okay? 2% um, included vitamins, 7% included uh, cosmetics, 7% uh, or, oral hygiene products, okay? Now, if you happen to put one of those items, diapers, cat food, etc., in your shopping basket, wiped out. Go from 40% of people that have food in there to 12, all right? Just that presence of that one quote-unquote disgusting item in the basket means you won't put other consumables in the basket as well. All right? So think about the implications if you're running a, 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 a pharmacy, right? There's a lot of disgusting products purchased in pharmacies. Where, does, where do pharmacies make all their money, out of curiosity? It's the food products. They make all their money off the food products. That's where their margin, if you, if you compare a price on on you know, a, a thing of cookies in a, in a supermarket to a pharmacy, the pharmacy is like 60, 70% higher. So they're making huge markups and margins on the food products in the, in the, in the pharmacies. They want you to buy those products. And this is me suggesting that it's not happening. Um, uh, what time do I go till? You know, I didn't notice when I started. Maybe, maybe 15, 20 more minutes. Okay, all right, I'm gonna jump over this one. I'll just give you the quickie one on this. Um, the, what we find, we look at the food strategies that people, um, that people employ, and we look at two different kind of uh, 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 eating strategies. A moderation strategy, so for example, I'll just have one potato chip, versus an avoidance uh, strategy. No potato chips in my house, period. Okay? And we look at when these are effective versus not. What we find is that the moderation strategy can be successful but only in low sort of uh, difficulty settings for you, okay? Now, a low self-control difficulty setting, you gotta be honest with yourself here, right? So, for example, for me, I really like wine, okay? That is not a low self-control setting for me. I can say all I want about, oh yeah, it's a low, it's not a difficult uh, setting for me to, to, with, with, you know, to sort of withhold and not, uh, not have that third glass of wine. But that's not true. Right? It's difficult for me. If I really don't want to have any drinks that day, I have to have an avoidance strategy. No open bottles of wine, nothing on the table, etc. All right. When it's difficult, you, the only successful strategy is avoidance. If you if it's a difficult self-control challenge for you, and you try moderation, you will fail. I promise you. All right. And if you look at folks, I think it's very compelling. This data we have a lot of data across a lot of self-control um, uh, challenges. If you find a certain self-control challenge to be difficult, you've got to employ an avoidance strategy. All right, so that's the quick and dirty uh, on that one. Um, okay, so let me say a little, so that stuff, I was talking a little bit about what's happening outside your conscious awareness. Let me shift a little bit. This is still outside your conscious awareness in some ways. Um, but I want to say a little about, um, about social influence. All right, have you guys talked yet about social influence on food? No, okay, so there's been a lot of dialogue, a lot of debate about whether in fact, whether and how we're influenced by, uh, by our social others, okay? Um, I think for most of us, we would like to believe that we're not, right? That we are in fact in control of what it is that we eat, and it's not that others in our environment are changing that, all right? So here's the basic setup. You've got a thin person or a large person, and they're choosing either something really healthy or something really terrible for them. The question is, first off, does their, does their choice of health versus non-health affect you? And does it matter whether they're bigger or small? All right. And so here's the basic setup. So we run what we call a, a, a movie viewing uh, setup, where people are coming in and they're going to watch a, a clip of a new movie that's coming out. And we tell them that we want the movie viewing experience to be as realistic as possible. So what's the first stop when you get to the movie theater? 
the concession stand, okay? So we set up a concession stand before they go in to view the film. And the con on the concession stand are a series of bowls of snacks, all right? And you're allowed to take as much or as little as you want. And we give them a, a bowl and the, or a little container that they can take their snacks before they go in to watch the, the movie, okay? And then they go over towards it, and it turns out that there's somebody standing in front of them in the queue, and the person in front of them is actually going to take some of the snacks. That person is an actor that we've hired, all right? And she is either dressed as she normally is, and she's a very t uh, tiny young woman, she's a size zero, um, or she uh, dons what we call our body prosthetic and becomes a dramatically larger young woman, okay? Um, so she's standing in front of you, and this is literally the view that you have, as she takes food from the, uh, the, the bowls and takes it in, okay? And she either takes a very small amount, I think two scoops of the food, or she takes a large amount, like 30, okay? <laughs> People noticed whether the person in front of them took two or 30, okay? It was hard to, hard to miss it, okay? All right, and, and here's what we find. In the situation, so first off, if there's nobody there in front of you, you just walk up to the table, you take eight and a half little scoops of, of snacks, okay? If she's in front of you, and she's her regular size, she's, she's thin, I think the first interesting piece here is look at the influence that the amount the person in front of you takes on how much you take, okay? You go from eight and a half up to 15. Or if she takes a very small amount, you go from eight and a half down to four. So it's basically a 100% increase or a 50% decrease in the actual quantity that you take, and we have the same, it's the, it works through with, in terms of how much you actually eat, all right? Huge impact on your, on your actual consumption from a social um, other that you've never met, by the way. You have no idea who this person is. It's not like they're your significant other, okay? What was interesting then, and this is all we have, a, I'm, I'm not going to show you all the data, but this is purely occurring outside conscious awareness. People have absolutely no idea that they're being influenced by the quantity that the other social other in their environment takes. What was interesting is when she was large, the effect is actually dampened pretty considerably. So people notice that the person in front of them in line is much larger than they are, and they actually consciously override the influence that person has on their own uh, consumption behavior, even though they don't even really know that they're being impacted, okay? Um, all right, and I think I'm gonna show you one more thing here, and this is some new work that we're doing um, in, in our lab that w is kind of fun, looking at, um, at choosing for someone else now, okay? So the, the movie study was me choosing food for me, this is going to be me choosing uh, um, food for me and someone that I'm going to do something with, okay? So let's imagine we're going to watch a, a DVD. Um, it's the first time. We're going to watch a, a movie. Or I'm going to pick up dinner on the way to meet up with a, a classmate. Or I'm going to bring food to a party, etc. All these kinds of environments. We're making choices for others, okay? Um, does the size of your friend influence the choices that you make for him or her, and for yourself. That's the basic research question that we have in this setting, okay? And the basic idea, so you know, you're gonna pick up takeout for, uh, they told you what they want for their entree, but not for their side dish. You get to the restaurant, there's two side dishes you can choose between. You can either have fries or a side salad in one group, or another group learns that you can have fries or onion rings, okay? So this is your choice. And you can obviously, up here in this first one, you can choose fries and fries. You can choose fries for you, salad for them. You can choose salad and salad, or salad for you and fries for them. What do you do? Oh. <laughs> I'll cut to the chase, because we're tight on time. Whatever you do, when they're large, you match. You do not go salad fries or fries salad, all right? You always match. So you bring fries fries or salad salad. And you know, here the, the, we have, so here's another one of these situations where we use, we use the body prosthetic to, um, to show the picture of, the, sorry for the, the uh, degraded photo quality there, 
the picture of your friend that you're going to um, uh, bring this for. Um, when, when, the, when health is salient to them, so it's fry salad, what you see is that, um, that when she's little, you match about chance about 60% uh, of the time. But when she's large, 90% of the time, you're going to match. All right? So salad, salad, fries, fries. Um, when she is, um, when, when it's fries or onion rings, in other words, when both of them are bad for you, you're not really sending a signal to your friend by choosing one over the other, and you're back to chance in terms of, of the choices that you're making, okay? So again, another fairly large sort of um, uh, magnitude impact on the choices that you make now for yourself um, because of a social presence kind of thing. Okay, so um, I think that, it, you know, I hope that I've planted the seed here that your actual food choices are, are potentially being quite dramatically influenced by people in your social environment as well as these things that are occurring outside your awareness. Um, people often ask me, well, what can you do? Like, what can I now do? Um, about this. I think that there's this, um, there's now an explosion of research on the psychology of food consumption that is becoming, um, we're starting to actually see an impact now on the way food is, um, is, is marketed to consumers, including young children. We're seeing um, a better uh, ability to educate um, individual consumers so that they're aware of some of these um, traps that they might fall into. Um, one of the things as a B-School guy, um, I feel it's important. I think that for many of us that are, um, that are passionate about issues, we often think that the way to make, uh, the, the, the most powerful way to make change is from the outside in. So in other words, I'll just sort of to generalize here, to protest from the outside and say, McDonald's, this is not right what you're doing. Or, Schools, this is not right what you're doing. You need to do this, you need to do that, etc. cetera. Um, as a business school person, I found that companies that have a profits incentive, if you can align your goals with their profit incentive, you can actually make them change really quickly. All right? And I'll give you an example. My, my, uh, my example of the one healthy option stuff and how this one healthy option can lead to backfire effects and have people choose really bad for you things. So for the last five years, I've been talking to school boards and school districts literally all around the world, um, trying to get them to change from this, what I see as a misguided uh, policy of having a single healthy option to having a, a, a much greater percentage of healthy goods on there. When that happens, by the way, the effect goes away. It's only when it's standing out there salient by itself on the menu. When you get a real mix of healthy things on there, the effect disappears. Um, dealing with the public policy makers, if you, I don't know how many of you guys have interacted with public policy makers over the, t over the years, it's excruciating. <laughs> it is snail-like, nothing happens, okay? I, I, um, in about a year ago, I started interacting with Compass Foods, which is one of the biggest um, uh, food service providers in the world, one of the big three. Um, they do K through 12 uh, cafeteria uh, dining for the city of Chicago public schools, Chapel Hill public schools, um, uh, the Charlotte ones, the Winston-Salem ones, et cetera, okay? Huge, big company. Started talking to them about this. They're like, oh, wow, well, that's really interesting. Well, what can we do? So we're now running two giant scale, giant scale, like hundreds of schools, um, experiments trying to change the mix of goods and looking at outcomes in terms of the percentage of, of fruits and vegetables that, that the kids eat, tying that to test scores, all of this stuff. These guys are doing it, why? Because they care about the world? <laughs> they think it will make them more competitive versus their competition if they can show that they're partnering with Duke University to bring healthier menus to kids to improve test scores and stuff. Now, is that wrong? I don't care. <laughs> the net outcome is that we will have kids eating way healthier diets all around this country. So by partnering with the guys that can just do it without going through years of voting and everything like that, we can actually initiate change from the inside out 
really, really quickly. And so I just want to throw that. I, I, I think I'm the, I'm the only B schooler coming, right? Uh, well, Britt was. Uh, oh, okay. 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 So I, I feel like it's important to say that you can actually achieve change by working with the big guys and not just sort of holding the picket signs outside. All right. So okay. At that, I will uh, I will turn it over. Good? Okay. Great. Well, thank you to Dean Patton and um, to Professor Rudy and Professor Thompson for inviting me and to Professor Fitzsimmons for a really fabulous presentation. So before I forget, I'm finishing an article on Pizza Hut in Bombay. And so much of what I've observed is about the training of workers to be able to anticipate the choices that people make. So this was really, really fascinating to me. Um, so I have 10 minutes to immerse you in an anthropological viewpoint on disgust. Um, and did, did anybody get a chance to watch the video that was circulated about what is anthropology? Anybody? OK. Anybody taken a cultural anthropology class before? I know <laughs> I have some former students here. So. OK, good. So you have a sense of what field work is. All right. So. Um, so in my work in Mumbai, I'm doing a lot of participant observation work. Um, and, but one of the things, and I can't quite bring that to you right in the moment, but what I can do is show you how we look at artifacts of popular culture and then think about you know, what effects those artifacts have in the world. And that's what I'm going to talk about today in relationship to disgust. So um, what I, and I'm also going to read a paper, which is, and, and interact, but it's a, a convention of the field as well. Um, so what I'd like to do in this really brief time that we have is ask you a broad question for your engagement. How do we think about desire and disgust in relationship to food? So that's my general question. So is it just about attitudes or what we think? Or perhaps is there something about the substance or the texture of food that intertwines with our inclinations and our aversions? So and, and what are all the ends of these preferences? Uh, put differently, what kind of cultural and social work does something like disgust do? So to begin answering these questions, we have to begin from the very material qualities of food, um, which you've got a, a great sense of, I think, of in Professor Fitzsimmons' quality. You know, what, what, it, what might we think a texture implies, dirty or clean? Um, but in the case of the Heather Paxson article, which you read, we're going to talk about the sort of microbial inhabitants of food. Um, and it's from that vantage point that I'm going to offer my response to Professor Fitzsimmons' paper and talk, which I think really um, compellingly unpacked the idea of choice, that choice is shot through with so many things that we, we may take for granted. But my own argument today is, is a little bit different. It's in a different vein, and it's this. Disgust is a sociocultural process, and it is a process forged between persons and foods. So my conclusion is, is that disgust does cultural work in the world. And as a cultural anthropologist, I'm interested in learning about what that work looks like and to what ends. So I'm going to talk about four different forms culturally that disgust might take, that we might talk about. And um, they're all cross-cutting in many different ways, but I'm going to take them on one by one um, so we can have a little bit more clarity. So the first one is about how disgust articulates social class. The second one is how disgust can um, inform us about gender and specifically masculinity. And the third is about how disgust can deal with the, uh, how we think of the exotic other. And the final way is the way that um, disgust can tell us something about how we might be dissatisfied with how we wrap into power structures in the world. And I'll get much more into detail on that. Um, so I'm arguing for the multiplicity of disgust, the idea that it's a vector with numerable cultural pathways. And thus, I take the title of my presentation, Active Live Cultures, from the side of a yogurt container that I saw billions of live active cultures. Um, I'm going to take culture in mul multiple modes there. Um, Professor Fitzsimmons asked, can products have the cooties? And so I am thinking about the cooties. 
That's what I want to think about. Um, that's the world I eat in. That's the world I think in as an anthropologist. And if we think of disgust from its Latinate root root, so disgust, right? You have to, which is truly to reverse taste, the reversal of taste. Um, then perhaps we, I'm going to propose, we have to might reverse or jiggle with at least our taken for granted assumptions about food and to think about how it connects us to delight and disgust, not just in terms of the food itself, but with the broader world. Um, I should say at the outset that I wish I had really fabulously disgusting food stories to share for you from my ethnographic research in India. I could not remotely compete with fermented shark. Um, frankly, I don't. And, and part of the reason is um, food in India is uh, at once extremely diverse. And yet in terms of its range of animals on plates, it's highly similar to what we might see here in the US. And this has much to do with religious and socially inspired dietary diktats that affect both what people feel that they should eat as well as what's circulating in, in markets. So for example, um, I do my research in Mumbai in a very specific neighborhood that has a large population of Catholics. And so the markets have plenty of pork and beef. But I cannot say the same for the markets that are five blocks away in a predominantly Hindu enclave or the same two blocks back in a predominantly Muslim enclave. So you know, there's lots of things that have to do with inclinations in markets. Um, there's also much to say about disgust as it plays out in caste-based behaviors in India, much which resolve, revolve around food. But I'm going to save that either for the Q&A or for a future discussion should you take a course on South Asia at Duke, of which we have many, and that is a shameless plug. So. Um, to begin here, it would be a familiar proposition to say that one student's disgust is another's pleasure. We talked about mayonnaise, but I'm betting at least one of you in the room adores ranch dressing, spoons it liberally on your salad while others gag. So the ranch lover, is anybody like ranch dressing? I really hope there is. This will help my argument a lot. Great. Okay. So the ranch lovers in the room might be fascinated with this innovation, the ranch dressing fountain, that um, in my view, uh, this ups the ante on the chocolate fountain. Um, but perhaps its sheer volume even makes you gag. So thinking about how that might be understandable is in anthropology what we call cultural relativism. It's that momentary sit standing in another person's shoes for a moment and thinking about the ways that they engage the world and how you might understand that. You may not agree, but you might understand that. You might reckon with it. I do not like grasshoppers, but I might understand why someone might want to eat them. That's cultural relativism. But that's not exactly what I'm driving at here. And so what I want us to think about is the way that disgust does something in the world. Remember, disgust does cultural work. So let's take the ranch dressing fountain. Where is it? Where are we in this photo? Yes, most likely, right? Euro America, perhaps. OK, where else? Buffet dinner, what else? Wedding, OK. If it's a buffet or a, a dinner or a wedding, what do you, what do you think? What's it look like in your head when you see this? <clears throat> Just a wedding? Keep it a little louder. Wedding cake. Wedding cake. OK, I'm thinking of sort of what, what kind of wedding? In other words, I mean, what, who's getting married? Where are they from? Who's? Southern. Southern. Interesting. <laughs> OK. Lavish. Lavish. Too much fresh vegetables for Southern? <laughs> OK. Um, you think it's a really expensive wedding? No. No, why? There's ranch dressing. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, so this is my head. right. Okay, so this fountain could be anywhere, but that we might imagine that it has a certain location in the world, inhabited by a certain type of people, suggests to me that it's not just that we're mapping a food onto a social group, but that we're ma we're always mapping our sense of that food onto the social group as well. Right? It's not just that we might associate ranch dressing with the South, but I mean, I would argue again, it's not a sort of full-hearted argument here, but I would suggest at least that there are dimensions of social class to the interpretations of certain kinds of disgust around food. Okay, So that's the first form, is around social class. Um, the second example is one about gender. So anybody recognize this? Yes, this is, uh, hey, people know? Yeah, this is Adam Richman from Man vs. Food. Um, so with the television show A Man vs. Food, we have a weekly contest of disgust, and one that I'm going to mark here as a contest about the articulation or performance of gender. So where being an American man is about eating a lot of food, and it's often spicy food at that, 
Um, the original premise of the series, which seems to have branched out to a more travel-oriented focus, perhaps given Richmond's ill health, was that Richmond would take on a challenger for a timed eating frenzy at any number of US food stops. So 15 dozen oysters, 10 pounds of stuffed pizza, wings and burgers laced with voodoo juice made from ghost chilies. Um, Richmond often wins. He doesn't always win, though. Food sometimes wins the man versus food, and they always black out. Thankfully, they black it out on the screen when the food wins, and he yarfs into a can on the side. Um, what is going on here, do you think, in terms of you know, what he's doing, the sort of purpose of eating, of disgusting things, or excess towards disgust, and gender, when I say gender? You know, what, what comes up here? Yeah? It's kind of like gear factor. It's novel for us to watch these things. Okay, so there's a novelty to it as well? Okay, what? Mastering, okay, so there's a, there's a, a, a quality of mastery here as well, and a, an assertion of mastery. Is that a hand? No, okay, that's a hand. Okay, yeah. Uh huh. Also, like, there's some sort of fear when you think about eating disgusting things that are going to harm us in some way. In the way of mastering, it's kind of taking on the fear or showing that it's not disgusting or harmful. Okay, so it might be making it more safe or approachable or. Okay, yeah. Can I push on the gender? Let me push on the gender thing a little bit. So yeah. Man, man is man is conquest. Yes. Yep. Yeah. I was just going to say, pound for pound, if you're more of a man, you need to eat more. Right. You about, eat most. Okay. All right. So we have a, a biological definition of, of him surviving with the with. The, I don't even know. I try, was trying to figure out what that exactly was and where. But yes. Okay. In the back, and then we'll move on. Woman versus calories, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, you're, it's, it's a really interesting point. So I actually raise um, the issue, um, you know, what one could say that um, this is only about men and that man versus food never has women on. Um, you know, I think we, can, we should probably get, get our research done and figure, figure that out. Um, but there certainly are, I mean, this is a really interesting point, there certainly are women who are champions of the sport of competitive eating. Um, this is Sonia Thomas, who's won several international contests, including the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest. Does anybody know, has anybody heard of her before? Yeah, do you know what her nickname is? The Black Widow, right? Okay, so I mean, and she's called the Black Widow specifically because she kills the men who might otherwise have won the contest, okay? So again, this is just my assertion that we, it's my hat tip to the ways in which articulations of disgust tell us something about the way that in specific places, gender is lived out. And she's tiny, which is, which is really great. Um, so um, our third form of disgust, uh, so we had social class and gender. The third one I wanna talk about is one that manifests cultural exotics or cultural exoticism. Um, the analytic question I have for you here is, how does food become the center point between you and another world in terms of how familiar or unfamiliar you are with it? Okay. So um, this is Andrew Zimmern, Bizarre Foods. People know Bizarre Foods. Okay, so Andrew Zimmern travels the world to find the strangest, at least to him, edibles, often involving bugs, the odd organ meat or two, and definitely lots of fermented foods. Um, maybe even fermented shark. Um, so, you know, the question we might ask is, what do we as viewers get out of watching this show, of witnessing and perhaps feeling disgust that's center pointed in another place? Um, and that's a question, of course, you know, for you to have your own discussions with, perhaps over dinner. But for the moment, let's address what this all might mean for Zimmern himself. So in his book, um, Andrew Zimmern's Bizarre World of Food, Brains, Bugs, and Blood Sausage. I could only dream of having such a good title. Um, Zimmern, I just, we just don't get the same things. Uh, Zimmern writes about, uh, this is a situation he's reflecting on eating wild puffins in Antarctica. Um, the sense of accomplishment I felt after that day was incredible. I have never had any eating experience like that. It's the type of eating that as a collector of these moments in life, I find unique. I've yet to bump into any other group of people in my world who have hunted wild puffins and eaten them. 
So in this invocation, I would suggest that Zimmern is the hunter collector, the gatherer of things exotic, putting the disgusting artifacts of the periphery on display for us in the center to see. Um, not terribly unlike, one might argue, colonial collectors of nearly two centuries ago put the exotic on display so that we might visit these worlds in miniature. And for Zimmern, our entry into these worlds is through disgusting tastes. And I think the political question there is, what does it mean to experience the foreign through the disgusting? Um, this is a great um, cover of how to collect exotic insects for the, the roundabout educated gentleman. Um, so lastly, I'd like to conclude with some thoughts on disgust as a cluster of relations to the broader world. And this is where I'm going to touch on the Heather Paxson article. So Heather Paxson offers us a different way of seeing the world through a mode of relation she calls microbiopolitics. So how is it, she is suggesting, I think, at Whole Foods, you can get hand sanitizer wipes for your cart as you peruse hunks of intentionally moldy blue cheese and grab a fermented kombucha drink on the way to checkout. So what allows these things to coexist in the world? And what does that mean for us as humans? So um, Heather, Paxson, as you might know, is an anthropology professor at MIT, and this is the article post Festurian Cultures. And so, you know, the first claim that she makes is that she's introducing the idea of microbiopolitics to think about how the ways that we think about dissent might have as much to do with attitudes about microorganisms as it does with how humans have to live with one another. In other words, she's trying to hold the micro and the macro in the same frame. Microbiopolitics, she says, is one way to frame questions of food ethics and governance. And to me, the way that I interpret that argument is to say that relations with food at all of its elemental scales, from the microbial to the surface, produce a particular form of knowledge about the world, about ourselves. So she contrasts a Pasteurian ethic, and that's the hand sanitizer, industrial regulation ethic, um, of eating hegemonic and industrial food worlds, and saying that eating well is safe, is eating safely, and that good eating is safe eating. So she's contrasting that kind of ethical relation with a post-Pasteurian relation with the farmers who do artisanal cheeses, people who love um, moldy cheeses, even as they perhaps are wiping down their carts. Um, and she's saying for these post-Pasteurians, microbes are not the invisible enemy lurking in cheese. They are the cheese itself. They're not the problem. They actually might be the solution. Um, in her essay, Paxson describes the incredible work of Mother Noella, otherwise known as the Cheese Nun. This is a photo of her. This is actually a photo of the DVD, that, of the movie that has been made about the Cheese Nun. Get it in a, local, in a blockbuster near you. Um, Johnning from place to place, swabbing walls and tasting cheeses, the Cheese Nun is doing the cultural work of preserving long-standing traditions. But Paxson suggests that she's doing political work as well, work in the world. And that's my conclusion to you. She writes, this is Paxson writing, unlike the Pasteurians, the cheese nun was curious to learn the identity of indigenous microflora to preserve them as they are. And that's really the take up, as they are. She has no interest in trying to improve on them in a lab. And so to me, that's the end game here. That's the anthropological end game that I might leave you with. I like the talk of end games a lot. Um, in, in a really positive light. So what might it look like from the vantage point of food, and specifically the critters in food, um, to live with each other as we are? So might we live without directing our focus onto the industrialized standardizing improvement of others, and instead direct the fountain of our disgust to the standards and industries themselves? Thanks very much. Well, this was um, really rich, and I need to tell both of our presenters as we move to Q&A that um, because of the, this course being recorded, I have to repeat your question, because th repeat the questions from the audience, and you need to come up with your microphone and, and answer them so that your questions get recorded as well. So let's open it up. Yes, way in the back.
Yeah, it, and if if you could finish the sentence by telling us your name and where you're from, that was the and the, your major if you're from A and S. All right, so the question from Michelle um, was in her understanding partly of the way we've been dealing with it in this class, but also in other perhaps analytic frames. Um, we have two kinds of disgust, one of which is repellent, that has to do with thinking of things as gross or um, something that you wouldn't want to engage with, and the other kind of disgust which might fascinate or captivate, um, even as you think you might be repelled, you still keep watching. Is that about right, Michelle? Please comment. Oh, you want to I can, I can, I can t give you my take on things. I'm not, in, in our view, I'm not sure that, and when I say our, I mean in my lab's view, I'm not sure that we think that there are these two different levels of disgust. It's absolutely clear, and you, you know, put your thumb on it, that sometimes disgust leads to this repel reaction, and sometimes it, it's as if we're drawn to it. Now, typically when we're drawn to it, it's not us engaging with the exception of the I think some of the male sort of uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, chest thumping behavior um, it, it, normally we're not drawn to it but as voyeurs we're often drawn to watching other people engage in disgusting behavior and in some of the work that we've been doing in our lab we've been trying to understand why it is we're drawn to this seemingly aversive reaction and one thing that we find is interesting is that we find that it's often the case that people watch those shows like the fear factor, et cetera, not by themselves. They watch them with others. And when you watch someone engaging in a disgusting act with others, for example, when you had the ranch dressing thing up there, I don't know if you guys noticed, but we all had the same reaction, or many of us had the same, it was like, ee, and everybody did the same, ee, and if, 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 we were all leaning backwards and making that expression on our faces. And, and there's a very basic psychological need or human need to basically connect with other people and one of the ways we connect through with other people is by having the exact same reactions as they do. And so one of the things that we think drives this, uh, uh, this desire to watch others engage in disgusting behavior is that it leads to a universal type response. We react at the exact same time in the exact same way and that is very appealing at, at a very deep level to us. Harris? No, I would just, I would, I would agree in saying that um, I mean, I like the schema that you're drawing up. Um, for me, it's all about the relations, and I, I really do agree that it's that it is relational. It might produce different outcomes um, that that you that you're identifying. You know, as one is perhaps more inert, and one is maybe more pernicious. Um, maybe as a, as an anthropologist, I'm always trying to the pernicious ones, try to, trying to find the, the power relations in, in, embedded in them. But I I think this idea about the ways that things happen by consensus is really important to think about that they are happening in relationships to others because to me the question then is so so what happens when that's the process by which we have something like racism or right so where we where we attribute disgust to particular groups so we have a mechanism by which it's relational so it's not just you right it's it's there's others in the picture as well so to me the question is absolutely who's who else is at the table and and how and how is this consensus being produced um, I will just jump in here as a scholar of uh, Indian thought that um, Buddhist analyses of desire will speak very openly about the fact that um, the uh, whatever the end game, to use Harris's terms, of any given emotion or desire is, is usually its opposite. So a Buddhist would not be surprised at all at your formulation that the extreme version of disgust is desire and the extreme version of desire is disgust. Um, another way to put it, which is a slightly different formulation, is that um, aversion is just another form of desire in that you want to get intensely away from it. Um, so there's two different approaches to the phenomenology in the mind of desire and both of these forms of research really get at that basic idea. So, um, let's see, I'm going to have you hang on, out a sec. Yes, in the back. And remind us to tell who you are in your background. I'm Danny from uh, the study map, and I'm, this is a marketing question. So um, I was just wondering about this paper that I remember in service that said that you did your um, cool touching packaging test <laughs> undergraduates. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, do you think that would vary among, like, say, um, the elderly or something? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. As you get older, does your... Perception of disgust 
go by the wayside? Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 yeah it's, it's an interesting question. It shifts slightly, but you'd be amazed at how strong it, it, it stays. So that, I mentioned at one point the data that we did with the big national pharmacy where um, it, looking at shopping baskets and stuff like that, one of the things we looked at was age and gender and other demographics because we have all that information. By the way, when you get one of those frequent shopper cards, all of your data is collected uh, and being shared with people like me. Um, so, so we had age, and, and it was really interesting. We didn't see any significant uh, difference across the age spectrum from teenage uh, members with the shopper cards all the way up to people in their 80s, you know. I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to repeat the question, so just for people watching. Um, for people watching the video, <laughs> got through that one again. Um, <laughs> Uh, the question was um, whether age was a factor in the discussed experiment that Professor Fitzsimmons did and whether there was a higher tolerance for disgust as people age or not. And that was his response. Okay, other questions, comments? Kathy. Oh, okay, we'll go to Kathy and then to... Okay, thanks a lot, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Kathy's question is, um, she acknowledges that disgust is relational, for sure, um, and that's been the underlying point of your two very different otherwise presentations. Um, but what about the real world of the actual microbes, and what about our relationships with those microbes? Um, in a way, a certain kind of industrial perspective on this, a marketing perspective, might have us conduct those relationships with microbes in one way, but she wonders whether an ecolo ecologically sound approach might be whether we could think about coexisting with those microbes, build a more flexible immune system, among many other possible relationships that we could have with the uh, microbes. And if that is true, then she poses the following question. Um, is it the wealthy people who are at the forefront who can buy the microbial cheese and have a relationship with different kinds of mold through their cheese? Or um, the people who actually are um, eating things which we have in an industrial and post industrial world understood as disgusting, but who are in a, a kind of different kind of relationship um, with those microbes, things like eating bugs or, or other kinds of foods that may be a result of poverty, but actually may have different relationship to the natural world. Is that about right? Better. <laughs> <laughs> Your response? I, I mean, I can give you my take on it. I, I think um, uh, we find across an income spectrum that these kinds of, like the, the product touching the other one, um, we find the effects regardless of income. So while the wealthy might be able to consciously override their aversion to microbes with high-end blue cheese, um, we find that at a non-conscious level, they're just as vulnerable uh, as anybody else from across the SES spectrum 
uh, in terms of these basic responses to things. I'll tell you the only group of people that we don't observe or we haven't observed in, the, in, in testing these kinds of effects are young children. And, it, and, and generally speaking, I, we find that it's, it, you know, and this is not just me, but lots of folks, that, that hardwired disgust reaction to things doesn't start to manifest until you hit about four-ish. Um, it, it's interesting as we, I've done work with, with Unilever and UNICEF in Africa, did a big hand washing campaign about two years ago where we tried to encourage um, uh, moms of young children to engage in hand washing behavior after they change the, the young children because millions of kids die around the globe because of, of bacterial contamination after, um, after uh, diaper changing. And initially, when we started talking about it, we talked about getting the youngest kids, the threes and fours and five-year-olds, to act as agents of change to go to their moms and try to encourage them to actually engage in hand washing. The trouble was when you went to four-year-old kids in preschools and whatnot, they don't experience disgust the way we do. And so it was actually very difficult. You had to go to a much older age child to actually engage them as agents of change. Harris, you want to come? Yeah, I think mine was the problematic mic, so oh. I'm going to try this. Oh, one. that's why you, yeah. So, okay, maybe that's working. That's now. good, yeah. yeah. That's good. Okay. Um, wow, that is a, a great, tough question. Um, I hope this isn't a punt, but I want, I, I'm going to answer by talking about the body. Um, so when you, when you were talking about the ways that um, we think about making, uh, making more, hmm, living more um, in a more coexisting manner with the environment by acclimating ourselves to critters, the first thing I thought of was something we talked about in, in my medical anthropology course, which was about um, parties that parents have for their kids in the U.S., instead of vaccinating them, um, of, of bringing them together um, to get chicken pox. Um, and it, it really, it's one of these topics that really, really pushes buttons in a lot of ways. And my sense, and we had a great, I mean, I'm just going to turn to Cynthia and say, I think we had a great conversation <laughs> about it. But the reason that I think it's interesting is because it, it, it makes us rem understand the centrality of the body well, when we're talking about eco ecology. So I'm, I guess my, I want to give you a response about that eating, eating bugs, you know, that, that um, cultures that, you know, are all about the grasshoppers, et cetera, are fine with it, and that it's, you know, maybe it's just a kind of upper middle class American thing to make it look exotic. But I actually don't want, I think my response is not going to be about the food. It's going to be about the, the fact that it's the body that has to really be thought of in there. And in the case of living with critters, living with the microbes, um, in a more coexisting fashion, we th found it really interesting that there were students in the class who had been in those parties, per se, and then there were other students who were vehemently opposed to it, right? So at the end of the day, it's kind of about how your body is in or not in line with government regulations about what you should, you should do. So I guess that, I mean, it's not a, a full-fledged answer, but I guess it's, to me, it's not always going to be about the food. It's going to be about the body that's eating the food and if it's conforming to, you know, the ways it conforms or um, protests certain kinds of norms. I'm going to just ask if there are any other students who have questions or, yes. Um, and I then I'll go to one you. of the things that stuck out to me, uh, especially in the paper about... Name, name oh, and, sorry. yeah. Um, my name is Emily. Um, I'm a double major in ICS and public policy with a minor in, uh, in Asian and Middle Eastern studies there. Um, and so what stuck out to me was that the idea that uh, the government's uh, regulations on food are to protect the consumer, right? That's the general understanding, and that's mentioned a few times throughout. And what, but what, one of the arguments was that this is not something we want to be protected from. This is something we want to indulge in ourselves. So it's not as though it's like the companies or the food producers are producing something that's harmful and the consumers don't know about it and the consumers need to be protected, right? This is a, a different scale. And so um, I guess it's the consumers, at least in this paper, don't feel like it's disgusting to eat the raw dog. And so I guess I was wondering if you guys um, could talk about, I don't know if this is, doesn't seem like your field or not, but just in dealing with it, like the idea of protecting someone 
from these foods or from these things that they don't want to be protected from. This is something they want to indulge in and they want to be a part of themselves. And, and they mentioned like in different countries like France where they think that this is possibly something that's beneficial to the... Mm -hmm. And so across cultures, maybe in India, like is that something that's talked about or is that something, the protection from indulgence? I don't know, it's, it's a very mm -hmm. odd thing. I guess so it's related to things like, <coughs> like alcohol or different things right. that you feel are harmful, but it's food. So Emily's continuing the theme, I think, of regulation in this larger question of, you know, something that came up in our reading, which is um, how do we think not only about our own personal disgust or aversion, but protecting from things that are harmful and the relationship of that to disgust. So she wants the two speakers to comment about what happens in situations when you have social worlds that might <coughs> think that one needs to be protected from something that they don't want to be protected from? And how would each of these uh, speakers deal with that situation? Um, I, I can give you two answers, I guess, from my perspective. And one's a professional and one's a personal. Most of, um, most of the companies and colleagues that I work with would argue that the free market will take care of this stuff. And that attitude is pretty strong. And, and I think that most folks believe that it'll, that the free market will sort out what's really bad for you, what's not. And if unpasteurized cheese, uh, raw milk cheese, isn't killing people, um, we'll know, right? And if it starts killing people all the time, then we'll know we have to do something about it. Um, that's the argument from many of my colleagues. I grew up in Canada, so I'm a bit of a socialist. Uh, and, and so my personal opinion is that a little sort of paternalism, um, if, it, if it's based on some good data, is perhaps something that we should all be willing to deal with. And, and so that's, but that's just a purely personal perspective. I am the first to admit that it irritates the heck out of me that I can't get certain types of cheeses here in the US that I can get in other parts of the world. And it seems <coughs> silly. Um, but perhaps that's what we have to put up with for some of the other protections that are in place. That's the socialist saying, I can deal with it. So. Harris? I do say about yes. Yes, I cannot say that I, that my daily colleagues are in, invested in the, letting the free market. <laughs> Not my colleagues. Um, so, all right. So, um, so what your your question is wonderful, and what it makes me think about is the uh, again and, and selfishly, this is how we reflect right on our own research. Um, so the ways in which regulation um, actually, besides constraining things, also opens up new opportunities. New opportunities are not always great. So I'll give you a perhaps. So I'll give you an example. In India, for example, the, the, there's abundant food adulteration. I could have talked about that today. Ten minutes seemed very unfair. I write a lot about food adulteration, the ways that there are scandals with milk poisoning, rice. There's, there's all kinds of chemicals and all kinds of different things, and it's done somewhat by shady kind of mafioso-like organizations, some corporate investments, no, not really sure. The government is trying very hard to regulate it. There's a Prevention of Food Adulteration Act that has been on the books since the 1950s that just got rehashed in the last couple of years. What that act does in, in idea is to regulate the food system so that adulteration can't happen, ideally to make people eat safe food. You might give an analog to not let them eat raw milk, it's not really happening there. It's about how to eat safe food. But what it requires is systematic labeling. And so what that does is that it opens up the door for food companies to bring in specific kinds of snacks um, because they have the technologies to be able to um, bring in Fritos and all these other things that are labeled perfectly already with the exact global nutrition standards. Right? So this is a way in which some of the very things we think might, might be pernicious, depends on your stance on it, arise out of um, ostensibly kind of um, good intention kind of regulation. So, uh, so as an anthropologist, I'm interested in seeing the regulation or the label as kind of a, a social thing that opens into all different kinds of possibilities. Okay, we have one more question from over here, and don't forget to introduce yourself. Or do you think it's dependent on how an outsider presents their 
Okay, so Margaret wanted to pick up on some of Gavin's um, activist experiences that he narrated with us, and she's interested because of her own career choices in um, whether change is effective um, from inside the company um, and or whether it could be equally effective or in what ways differently effective from outside the company. So what's the best way to think about food policy change inside or outside the company? Well, it's, it's a great question. I don't think there's any one answer to it. And I think that the insiders and the outsiders, there's a symbiotic relationship there. If you don't have the outsiders protesting and making clear that we want healthy foods in schools, that we want things that are good for the environment and don't ruin our natural resources, et cetera, the insider has no argument to make. We need the outsiders to, to, to have that voice so that the insider can say, hey, we'll be more profitable if we meet the needs of those folks with that voice. And so there's this partnership. When I was, the point I was trying to make was we can't all be outsiders. There has to be a voice on the inside as well, alerting folks to the profit opportunity of meeting the needs of this giant group of customers. And so the two really have to work together hand in hand, I think, for it really to, for change to happen. So I'm going to take the convenience prerogative and remind us that what we're now asking all uh, each other to do is to push beyond just complementarity and think about how these two presentations might be mutually transformative. So we heard a couple of major differences and even laughed at them uh, when Harris said, you know, um, none of my colleagues are interested in figuring out um, about how to help companies make more profit and everyone left because we got that Harris doesn't exist in that world. But we also got that Gavin exists in that world and actually is quite effective in that world. That was an authentic difference which could, which could also be seen as a form of complementarity in the way that Gavin just mentioned. I know we've moved to a first name basis. I hope that's okay. <laughs> um, and so now I would like to ask you incredibly smart two people to state the thing that has changed you in your own work about the other's presentation today? That's tough. <laughs> I can take a crack. So, so I, I think that uh, for me, what I really enjoyed uh, about Harris's sort of take on disgust and on things was the, and it, and it got me thinking again about this motivation to, to tackle and engage with, with disgusting goods. And, and, you know, I mentioned some of the work we've been doing, but I think this notion of the, um, you know, we often take the actor, the person engaging in the actual disgusting consumption thing, like the guy in the TV show, as a given, and don't think about examining those motivations, and, and really are talking about observing or the, the motivations of the voyeur. And, and I, I think, you know, th this got the wheels turning about, perhaps I should be going back and, and pushing a little bit on thinking about why that actor is doing what, in this case, he, and probably most of the time, he is doing. And so that was sort of the, I think that's what will probably shift my sort of path going forward. Yeah. Fabulous. Harris? Um, I have a real appreciation for your um, sense of the experimental and sort of grounding in the experimental. So I often tell my students who, you know, the social world is so messy, so it just let it be messy, right? Mm. Because. Uh, as an ethnographer, you're sort of dropped in somewhere, and your job is to describe, engage and describe. Um, and one is not quite an experimental science. I, mean, I was actually originally trained in the science, so it's, so it's sort of interesting to you know take a much a different leap later on in life. Um, so I, yeah, I have a real I have a renewed appreciation for it. The um, you know I, t I actually take seriously what it means to control an environment and then um, glean information that that comes out of it. Um, I also know how to make better crafts, which is something that I have to be able to do. But I mean, I think that, the, that when you see compelling results like this, you do see that there are ways in which the real messy social world can be mirrored in experimental ways, which is one of the founding principles of, of a lot of experimental social science, psychology, yeah. political science. And yeah. um, you know, I, I, I take that to heart. I think, think about that a lot more. Um, so, housing situations. Yeah, and I don't want to falsely construct a kumbaya moment here. So <laughs> I, I do think that the differences between these two presentations are marked, and I hope they argue. I'm going to have fun at dinner. Um, but in addition, I want to say, in a university, in my long years in university context, some of the most difficult relationships are between liberal arts folks and business school folks. And so what we've trying, we're doing in a little bit of a way here is to show 
some ways in which that relationship of difference, authentic difference, can actually be useful one to the other. My final word to you is beware the one healthy option. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you at dinner. <laughs>